Over seven million different animals inhabit our planet. I couldn't be happier because we are covering the, the warthog. warthog. Oh, yes. We're in unison. We're like. What can they teach us? They had did the mirror self recognition test, which of course elephants pass, and marine, some marine mammals, and uh, parrots, some parrots, and things like that. Uh, and the pig. Many species are in crisis and need your help. Join the movement at allcreaturespod.com. Welcome to the All Creatures Podcast. This is Chris. And I'm Angie. And a healthier Angie, right? Yes, definitely healthier. Um, and I couldn't be happier because we are covering... The, the warthog. warthog. Oh, yes. we're in unison. We're like, I know, we're like I know. Soul sister and brother over here. Yeah. <laughs> I'm super excited. I have been wanting to do a species of pig for a long time. So right. you I, have. and because I had been a little bit under the weather recently, I was able to do a lot of research and reading up a lot about pigs. So it's going to be a fun pod for sure. Yeah. And, you know, so we, last week we released meerkats because poor Angie was was not feeling well at all but you know so now we're releasing their good friend the warthog mm -hmm. because we talk a lot about in the meerkats the lion king mm -hmm. so here we have pumbaa the circle of life <laughs> i think that's probably off key there with my uh no it's but... it's fine you sing way better than i do <laughs> but... i don't know i i it's been i haven't yeah i haven't seen the new movie yet so oh really I know. it came out like months ago like in the, in the meerkats we're talking I'm... about like it just came out last week but now it's been months you gotta watch it with your kids it's cute i know i know I, we watched the old one i just haven't seen the new one Okay. Okay. Yeah, well, it needs to come on Netflix or some available source. It prob I don't think it is yet. So, well, everybody's favorite warthog Pumba in the last one was voiced over by Seth Rogen. And so my good friend, Mike Bona from the LA zoo, who I just saw last week, he's like, you need to tag Seth and all your stuff. So, okay. Hi, Seth. this week we're going to try and see if we can get Seth Rogen to listen and learn more about warthogs. So, now I've seen a lot of his movies, yes, <laughs> but, I haven't, yes. but I'll have to, yes, I'll definitely have to add the, the new Lion King. That's awesome. I didn't know that. Cool. Yeah. He's great in that. He's great in that. So these are just, they're endearing. You know, the meerkats are endearing. These are endearing. Well, and I'll tell you another reason why they're endearing besides, and we'll, we'll get to their descriptions because, uh, they everybody knows what they look like, but their external physiology with their warts that aren't really mm -hmm. warts and things like mm -hmm. that is just so cool. And their tusk, but they are near and dear to my heart because I I love the family of pigs in general. Mm -hmm. um, I've been lucky enough to work with domestic pigs, and they're just so cool. And I uh, also have been blessed enough to see wart hogs every time I've been in Africa. Yes. That's yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. One of the and species. yes. And the first, okay. uh, the first time I saw them with my best friend, Nani and her husband, Bob in uh, lower uh, Zambia. And mm -hmm. then the second time with John, when we were on our little hut uh, provided for us by our dear friend, Allison, we were in um, Northern Zambia and mm -hmm. that was really special because him and I were just having our coffee and sitting mm -hmm. on our little hut porch. And it was a mom with her, her juveniles. Oh like, gosh. Like five so or cute. six of them. So just yeah. like, just like you, know, you, the dream come true. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and then recently uh, when I was in Africa uh, this past fall, I saw, I think it was two, two or three sub adult females. So mm -hmm. they weren't fully grown, but they didn't, um, I, I, there wasn't a male with them, which we'll right. talk more about that males are typically solitary. So there are species like for me, I, I as much as I say that I want to see the leopard and yada blada and that will never happen. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm never going to give up. But yeah. the warhog is, uh, they are a good one that if you are typically in a wildlife park, uh, mm -hmm. they should be around because today we're talking about a species that the numbers are good. Yeah, they're okay. They're doing they're okay. okay. They're okay. They're at least concerned yeah. by the IUCN. Mm -hmm. And that, and we'll talk about as we move through the podcast, that doesn't mean they're out of the woods for sure um, mm -hmm. by any stretch of the ma our imaginations. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about 
conflict with farmers and things like that. But overall, there's not like some of their cousins that are critically endangered right. uh, at the zoo you worked with. Um, mm -hmm. The Visayan warty pig was really cool there at the at the zoo, right? Right. Well, because you would have you had some of your um, your wildlife cameras being able right. to watch their behaviors and a lot of your yeah, students behavior. watching yep. the behaviors at the Santa Fe Zoo. The Visayan warty pigs, they're critically endangered and um, they're endemic to like the Philippines area. And so a lot of mm -hmm. the accredited mm -hmm. zoos are doing uh, breeding programs to try to increase their numbers. So, which is great. The Santa, the Santa Fe Zoo does that. It's super awesome. They do. They do. And there is, it's going to be interesting when we get into the pig family. You're, it's some surprising statistics oh, on that. Cool. Yeah, so we, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So they're, they're really cool. They're really cool. And I just want to say thank you to Caleb this week. He joined us on Patreon from Tennessee. So he sent us a really nice message and, and uh, how he wants to do more for conservation. So that just, again, you know, with Patreon, we're giving back to wildlife organizations uh, every month. This is unique, I think, in all podcasts that, you know, we actually give back to the people that are out, that are fighting for them in the wild. You know, we're spreading the wealth. Again, just, you know, if you go to Starbucks or any other coffee house, you know, what you pay, you can donate that to us and we give portions of that to wildlife and you're supporting free education. Absolutely. You know, we have what, what, 200 hours of free audio on all these creatures and amazing It ain't interviews. free, buddy. I'm uh, I paying, I, 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 keep pushing my, I keep pushing those credit cards off. No, I know, I know, <laughs> I, know. I know. I love it. Are you, what, what, what else am I going to do? Just keep watching Grey's Anatomy every night all I night? Know. No, that's, no. I love doing my research. But yes, it is... Um, Obviously, it's a passion project for Chris and I, uh, mm -hmm. for the most part. But and of course, if you can't pay, that's why Chris and I do free education. We totally mm -hmm. get it. Um, we're there as well with y'all. Uh, oh, did I just say y'all? Yeah, oh, you've no, been living no, in no, Florida no. for Edited a while. Out. No, nope, no, nope, no, nope, no, nope. no. Nope. <laughs> you little Michigan girl is uh, now a Florida girl. <laughs> if you let me try that again. Of course, what. The other way that you can help if you can't give a dollar or five or whatever is to uh, subscribe, rate, and review. For instance, I want to give a huge shout out to TMI Trek, who recently gave us a raving review on iTunes. And I thank you. Uh, the review is basically stating that our podcast has help them want to apply and get accepted into a fish and wildlife conservation That's program. Awesome. I know. What? I know. TMI Trek, thank you. That's what I keeps know. us going. That's why we don't we don't need no money. I mean, well, you well, know. Well, we do. <laughs> <laughs> Speak for yourself. It's like, no, we, Chris, I, we're like good cop, bad cop. I know, I know, uh, I know. No, yeah. no. Um, but no, that no, that's really honestly all yeah. I need is uh, we just need more, more wildlife warrior, warriors out there. And mm -hmm. the other thing, too, is if you haven't followed us on Instagram and Facebook, I highly recommend you do that because Chris is so great with all that stuff. But on Facebook, we actually have our own group. Mm -hmm. And recently there's been a lot of extra conversations in there just about what's happening with wildlife uh, stories that Chris and I don't have time to cover, of course. And then even uh, recently. I know, Angie, I just read that. It's from Chantel and, and she's down from Australia. So you know, she's looking at ways to reduce her impact on the environment. And it's just Karen and some others have chimed in and, and talking about that. So that's just, that's what the group's about. It's about sharing and well, learning. It's, it's even funnier, you know, groups are good because I'm obviously in all creatures pod and a couple other ones of interest that I have, but there's a commercial now for it. There's a Facebook group commercial. I saw oh, yeah? on TV. That's like, <laughs> if you really like, uh, I, what was it? It was funny. It was, yeah. oh, it was about rocks. But mm -hmm, it was like, mm -hmm. you could like rock stars or collecting rocks, or it was like all these different like groups that had to do with rocks. And I was thinking like, this commercial would be way cooler if it was about wildlife, but you know, probably wouldn't, you know. So anyways, but yes, <laughs> Facebook groups are a thing. And so please join us on ours if you haven't already. Um, I think you'll definitely appreciate it. Yeah. Or you can just, you know, share this episode, share one of your favorite episodes. Like again, my friend, Mike Bona from the LA Zoo just shared our electric eels. He didn't know that they're knife fish. So that is funny. Wow. That's my animal stump, expert. Stump the expert. Yeah. 
I yeah, love small. it. Yeah, <laughs> small. The giraffe expert, but yeah. Still, hey. Yeah, it's so good. But animal you, expert. You, yeah, animal expert. Uh, Mike Bona, LA Zoo. All right. So let's talk about warthogs. And, and stay tuned because Pumbaa doesn't mean warthog. It actually has a very complex meaning. So we'll get to that, you know, so shout out to Seth Rogen again and the Lion King, but God, it's just that movie. They do such a good job with the warthog and meerkat. It's just so great. So you said these large flat heads have these warts on them, but they're yes, not warts. I, I think obviously if you're driving, don't do it. I know a lot of people drive or if you're mm-hmm. in the middle of, a work situation, but mm-hmm. Google image a picture of a warthog because I guarantee that you you need you need that in your life. Yeah, because <laughs> we're going to describe it, and we're not going to make them sound as cool or as unique as or charming, in my opinion, as they mm-hmm. are. Mm-hmm. No, they're 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 uh, they're just amazing looking, and quite frankly, because. While I have seen them in um, in the wild three times, woo woo, mm-hmm. uh, it's from a distance. And especially back in the day, we didn't have good cameras. And this time, of course, this last time I went to Africa, when there are nice cameras, I didn't bring one. So the close-up picture of a warthog, I had never been privy to. Mm-hmm. So in preparing for this pod this past week and watching a lot of videos, but then, of course, zooming in on some very high-caliber amazing wildlife photo, you know photograph experts photography i guess photography experts they are incredible and now i know why they're called warthogs mm-hmm. i mm-hmm. didn't know that no they're i've never worked they, with warthogs so I, yeah. I mean, that's definitely my disclosure there and, and they're I, not at every zoo i saw them at the wild oh, animal no. park no but they're not at every zoo yeah. definitely not no it- uh when at lincoln park we had red river hogs mm-hmm. um a cousin, but still right. not, not war hogs. Yeah. 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 And so, yeah. So you're saying the, the warts, they're not actually warts where it gets its name, warthog, but they're made of bone and cartilage. Mm-hmm. And I, the males actually have two pairs of these and the females only have one. Sure. Yeah. And that's, and I think it's just the males that I can't get over the males suborbital, So below mm-hmm. the eye. Mm hmm is they're really, really striking. And they are. I mean, obviously it depends on the age of the male and things like that, but they, I mean, how many inches are we talking? They're about six inches each side. Like these things are bigger than you think. That's they're bigger what I'm, than you think. I yeah. didn't, first of all, I didn't, I never really put it all, put everything together mm-hmm. <laughs> as far as why mm-hmm. they were named warhogs. Mm-hmm. But then mm-hmm. as I was reading about it, I'm like, oh, okay. Cause they have, you know, some, some extra stuff. Next on their year, face, yeah. On their face. But then, yes, when I started pulling up pictures and these warts, the they're not, yeah. yeah, these things are sticking outside of their face, six inches on the males yeah. right below their eyes. I, I was like, ding a ling a ling, a light, a light bulb yeah. went off. Um, I guess, and so I just, you know, and then of course, I think it's important to note right away that they're not warts. They're, mm-hmm. um, that they're connective tissue that's made out of cartilage. So mm-hmm. think of like your your earlobe or something, right? right. Car- cartilage. And then the second pair of warts, which we know are not warts, it's connective, hard connective tissue, is kind of around the maxillary area or the, the upper jaw. So mm-hmm. uh, below the eye, but yet uh, be- before the first tusk. And mm-hmm. so they just are... and. <sighs> They're just incredible. And the other thing about a warthog, which I think is strikingly different than most definitely, you know, the domestic pig that I worked with or even um, uh, Red River hogs, which I've had the pleasure to get to know behind the scenes a lot at a couple different accredited zoos, is this flat face mm-hmm. of the warthog. <laughs> I know. <laughs> big. It's, it's big. It's it it's top big. heavy. <laughs> it's, it's Yes. Their, their large head makes them a little top heavy, if you will. And it's flat. It's this very, just a very dis- distinct flat face. I, I know I'm not doing a great job des- describing no. it, but <laughs> I think, you know, people see it. And then the one, the other thing that got me surprised is I knew they had tusks. I didn't know they had two pairs of tusks, right? Bingo, bango. So, I didn't know that either. Yeah. 
Yeah. So the upper tusk can be up to 11 inches long or 30 centimeters. And then right under that, they have these lower, smaller tusks, which can be five inches or 13 centimeters. Yeah. I was like, I, I just always saw them with big tusks and I just thought they were, you know, one each side, but there's two. There's, there's two. two. Yeah, yeah. That, that, like I said, zooming in on like some actually mm -hmm. really good wildlife photos cleared that up for me too. And I, I had no idea. Um, and I, and I don't think, yeah, I, I'm trying to think of a zoological institution that I've been to where there's been warthogs that I don't. It's rare. Yeah. San it, Diego yeah. had them and that was yeah. it. Yeah. So yeah. LA zoo didn't have them and mm -hmm. yeah, but. And of course they have the tusk, which they're iconic for, but I think also mm -hmm. their, um, their mane, their black mm -hmm. mane that goes down basically, you know, their spine to the middle of their back and the hair is, you know, it's, it's kind of like a. A comb over. It's yeah, not yeah, super. It is, it is. It's not super thick like um, right. the Visayan warty hogs. They have a beautiful, you know, more right. well developed mane, if you will. And they have. And they also have yeah. a lot more. They also have a lot more fur on them. Where a mm -hmm. wart hog is, it has a light coat of fur, if you will. Right. But um, I mean, which not 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 a lot because well, it lives right. in Africa, so it doesn't need right. a thick thick coat of hair yeah and they're pretty i mean pretty big you know they they can get up to 60 inches long or 150 centimeters and height at the shoulder up to 85 centimeters or 33 inches mm -hmm. so like i said they're they're bigger than you think you know especially when you see them at the zoo i was like whoa and then females can weigh up to 165 pounds or 75 kilograms okay mm -hmm. when then the males can weigh up to 330 pounds Wow. Kilograms. Yeah. I don't think I've ever had the privilege of seeing a male in the wild. It <laughs> that's was not big. that big. That's, yeah. They're I big. Yeah. Them. They're big. They're big. Now, there's two types of warthogs, Andy. You know, you, you know this the common warthog, mm -hmm. and then there's this desert warthog. Okay. So the common warthogs range is pretty wide across Africa. So, West Africa, across, you know, again, staying out of the Congo basin, that's really heavy rainforest, but just on the edges of that near the, the Southern Sahara desert. Mm -hmm. So they range all the way across into Kenya, uh, Somalia, Ethiopia. And that's where you find the desert warthog. Okay. So the common warthogs, West Africa to that range. And then South through, through Tanzania, Zimbabwe uh, to where you were in Kruger into South Africa. And then actually across over to Angola. And Botswana. Mm -hmm. Okay, so pretty wide range, just just a, kind of around that that huge Congo basin, you know, where the mountain gorillas and everything else live. Yeah, that's not where you won't find warthogs. Well, and besides the the desert warthog, um, mm -hmm. I did find that there's several subspecies. Depending yeah, and on we'll get to that. Their yeah. location. Yeah. 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 The commons. Yep. Several subspecies, but there are two distinct species of warthog. Right. So, so the desert right. and then the common. Common. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. 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 So again, they, you know, the, the not heavy desert or really dry desert where, you know, we might see the fennec fox or some of those species. But, oh, you know, I love how you give a shout out to Fennec Fox. I know. I love them. I love them. Uh, but, you know, wooded savannas, the steppes, the, the semi-deserts, that's kind of where they, they like to live and survive. Now, found a very interesting paper because, you know, one of the things we always talk about is, you know, not only just the importance Science. of... <laughs> yeah, of zoos, right? We talk a lot about zoos and, and we're big supporters of, of accredited zoos because of the work they do in conservation and also because they hold a lot of emergency populations of a lot of these species. And again, we're still waiting to hear back from Australia, you know, on some of these, these critically endangered species and, and how they might have survived the fire. And my hopes are the zoos down there have some of these species in reserve because I think a lot of them in the wild got wiped out. With that, looking at Africa specifically, because a lot of people say the animals just need to be in the wild. And we agree. You know, Angie and I have never been you know, shy about that. We agree. Animals belong in the wild. That's where they belong. But unfortunately, there's not much wild left. It's just, it's gone. It's humans have taken over <laughs> the planet and, you know, not only habitat destruction, but just human presence, farming, roads, 
you know, development has reduced the wild, quote unquote wild, to about 20, I believe it's like 22% of what it was before we hit the industrial revolution. So I found a really cool paper talking about Africa specifically. And this one was in Biodiversity Conservation in 2013. And the title is The Size of Savannah, Africa, A Lion's View. And this was Mm -hmm. Dr. Riggio and others out of Duke University, uh, had National Geographic Society was in on this, wildlife conservation was in on this. So, you know, big paper. And basically what they were, what they argue is, okay, if we look at it from a lion's view, because this is the continent's top predator. Mm -hmm. And so where lions are and surviving, they would assume, okay, there's, there's pretty much an intact ecosystem, you know, in Africa. Now I'm Mm -hmm. sure there's some other areas that lions may not be in, but they're just trying to say, okay, if we look across Africa where lions should be, and then we're going to compare it to where lions actually are to get an idea of habitat destruction. Okay. So, you know, they're looking at just these specific areas and basically the savannas is, is where they, they were looking at. And we already know that the savannas in Africa have shrunk in the last 50 years. And they're with the human population growth there. They think it's just in the next 40 years, it's just going to, it's going to have a huge impact on the, on these animals, not just lions, but everything in there. So what they found, and I have this interesting map and I'm going to try to, I'll post this on our show notes just because looking at what I'm trying to draw a correlation is where lions are, that's pretty much where you can expect warthogs to be. Right. You know, because lions have a very similar range. And so looking at this map in West Africa, lions are barely hanging on across the, the lion strongholds really are Tanzania down where you were in Kruger and then parts of Botswana. That's where lions are, are doing. I saw okay. a lot of lions. Mm-hmm, it mm-hmm, was mm-hmm. awesome. They don't, yeah. most of the time they're just laying in the road. They don't right. really, but I did see a move. And so that's always a, uh, uh, they were walking and stalking and doing really cool things, which is super rare because the times yeah. before where I've been in Africa, they're always laying under a bush, not doing anything. Cause that's, I mean, they're cats. Cats don't do much. So I, the best is still that night photo, that night video you got of them walking by your truck. Yeah. Yes. I, yeah. We'll just share that. I don't know if you shared that yeah. or we can share, or if you probably did on Instagram, but we'll share some of them yeah. on, uh, on Facebook. Yeah. No, it was, inc- it was, inc- it was, it was totally, I don't want to say uh, life changing because I feel like my family, if my family was with me, it would have been life changing. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> Since it was just me, uh, and, uh, the, the fellow, uh, conference goers, it was, it was, mm-hmm cool how about that it was super cool i'm all getting right. cheesy let's all right warthogs sorry right got, right no got... no but it's africa mm-hmm. and you saw it you saw one of their strongholds so lions are doing well there but most of the rest of the savannas in africa they're not and so what this was study was looking at you know what's driving habitat loss and, and they have shown dramatic habitat loss for lions which again would lead to you know some warthogs and other species And it's basically growth, economic, population, resources being used up, agriculture, all of it is driving habitat loss there. Mm -hmm. And right now, you know, Africa's booming. The economies are growing, which is good for the people there. But that doesn't always translate well into wildlife. So right now, the, the African Development Bank Project is estimating that by the year 2030, Africa's population is going to grow to about 1.6 billion and today, or well, six years ago, it was at about a billion. And so that's about 20% or almost 20% of the world's population. So again, stressing the resources, things like that. It, it, it's again, this is the story that we're seeing in Africa. This is a story we're seeing in South America, here in North America, you know, in Asia. Course, so yeah. just these studies are important because they take a snapshot and say, this is what's going on. And so when people say, Animals need to be in the wild. We totally agree. It's just we need to protect what wild's left. And that's, again, one of the the reasons we do this podcast. Now, I do want to do some good spin and give some conservation optimism. There is some good news coming. So I found another study. This one's awesome. This came out in 2016, just a couple years ago, three, uh, four years ago. Net effects of ecotourism on threatened species survival. 
Mm-hmm. And so this came out of a, a down in Australia. Uh, Cl- Griffith quick cliff University. notes. Was it good yeah. that I was in Kruger doing ecotourism? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yay. So they, they looked across the planet and looked at where ecotourism impacts because mm-hmm. ecotourism a little bit's coming under attack from some segments that it's, it needs it's to be harmful. done well. And we've talked about yes. that in some of our conservation news segments. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But when they looked at some species and looked at the impacts of population with ecotourism, the news is good. Okay. So in Costa Rica, the great green macaw, ecotourism has benefited population growth. Uh, the the Holoc gibbon in India, it, it's been okay. Uh, the African wild dog definitely has improved. Uh, cheetah in Africa has improved. Golden line tamarind in Brazil has improved. African penguin has improved, has helped. And orangutans has helped in Sumatra. The only species they documented that ecotourism had a negative impact was back down to New Zealand, the New Zealand sea lion, that ecotourism actually, they had drop in pup survival because it was disrupting uh, the moms and everything there. So Natural ecotourism. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, but looking at this stuff, you're like, okay, you know, the net effect is, is, is positive for most species. So we have to be careful with ecotourism on certain species, but overall it's having a, a big benefit to growth. So good. So that's, so that's a big thing you did in Kruger. People going to Africa, your dollars are helping and they, they are helping protect those habitats and species survival. And it's showing the locals, that's the important part, that it's worth keeping them around. It's worth keeping mm-hmm. these animals because it brings in money. Exactly. And if you can't go to Africa, because let's be realistic, it's not easy mm-hmm. <laughs> and not cheap. Uh, you can go to your local accredited zoo where a lot of money goes back into conservation. Not only are they keeping an arc of a lot of species, but they're also breeding a lot of critically endangered species that can often be released in the wild mm-hmm. or once again, keep those genetic strongholds going. So someday they potentially can be released in the wild, like several amazing conservation stories that we've talked about, like the black footed ferret and the California condor and things like this. And so once again, since it could be hard to go see Pumbaa Mm -hmm. in the wild. So looking at statistics just from the United States and our 216 accredited zoos Mm -hmm. last year, $231 $231 million spent mm-hmm. in conservation projects, which included 115 reintroduction programs. Of yeah, species that in these reintroduction programs are species that are either threatened or endangered. And so supporting, and of course, we, we highlight on this podcast um, other amazing groups that are fighting two for these animals. Mm -hmm. Um, But sometimes it can be hard to navigate the weeds of which one is which or which one's Mm -hmm. that. And so just in general, just being a, being a a participant at your local zoo helps. Right. You're yeah. Your AZA accredited institution, they are doing a ton, a ton. And we've, you know, the more people we interview, uh, you know, the, the zookeepers, you know, I know San Diego Zoo, the koala team went mm-hmm. off to Australia. Yes. I know one from Lincoln Park Zoo went off uh, a while back in her day to go and study wildebeest, right? Oh, <laughs> Didn't that's they right. Send you they to- sent me, to, <laughs> yes, wildebeest and uh, zebra. Mm-hmm. And yes. Like, so Who do you know at Lincoln Park Zoo? <laughs> <laughs> it's late at night here, folks. Sorry. Oh, it's so funny. But yeah, I mean, they, they supported you to do that, Absolutely. right? So, of course, they send, they send one know. or two zookeepers a year to go uh, right. do conservation um, in, in, a, in an area of their choice. Yeah, and I know Mike. Mike went to Africa and did stuff with uh, giraffes, you know? So, you know, each zoo institution, they, they support their team in, in going around the world. So, again, it's just... You know, we need to keep our eyes to the ground and, 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 and keep protecting these species and ecotourism is a big piece of that. So looking at warthogs specifically, you know, when you do go to these places, it does benefit them. It does. And, you know, it, good because I want to go back and bring my family. 
I know. I know. <laughs> Although I'm gonna go. I know we gotta save our pennies because uh, that's uh, crazy, <laughs> crazy, stupid money. Um, yeah, but in the expensive. meantime, we just keep going to our, our local accredited zoos and uh, yeah. looking at yep. the the animals there. So yeah. Well, and you know why care about a warthog? It's I mean not that only face. they. I know they're so beautiful, and they do. You know they are important in, in the food web. You know up and down. But some of the things I found with them, and we talked about it in Meerkats last week. So I, you know, I re-listened to it, the episode, you know, when, when we did it last year. And we talked about how the mongoose, the warthogs will allow the mongoose to come around and pick parasites off them mm-hmm. and groom them. Mm-hmm. And so that's, I think, what, what and meerkats the ver- and don't do. And vervet monkeys. Yes. And, and yellow hornbills. Yes. <laughs> That's what I was going to say. <laughs> so they have a symbiotic relationship with birds and these other species to get rid of pests. Yes. So red billed they... and yellow billed oxpeckers. Mm-hmm. Yes. And then and then the thing, you know, pigs do, they root around, they churn up soil, they aerate, they seed dispersal. I mean, they do all these things, build, you know, uh, take over burrows and, and do different things. So they're important to the ecology, to the environment. You know, these animals learn to depend on each other. So they are a key piece, a key, a definitely key piece to the Africa savannas and deserts. Yes. And right now, like we said, they're least concerned by the IUCN, but they have fallen victim to some farmer conflict um, in that they can they're smart, uh, and we'll talk more about that sh- here shortly, but they can cause damage to various crops, such as rice fields and peanut crops, and so that can cause conflict. And then cattle ranchers sometimes see raw hogs as competitors for their other grazing species in southern Africa. Mm-hmm. So it's, 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 there's some touch and go, and, 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 and some issues if they're outside of some of these national parks, as far as uh, people not necessarily wanting them around. But at the end of the podcast, we'll talk about some groups that are trying to help combat some of these human uh, warthog conflicts. Conflicts, so, mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, jumping into their natural history, warthogs are from the pig family or the Sude family. Mm-hmm. And this is even toed ungulates and it, hogs, boars, pigs mm-hmm. is what they're con- known as. Now, Angie, this one was surprising. This is, I think this is my surprising statistic besides some of the other stuff we've already said. There are only 19 species of pigs on earth. That's it. That number seems yeah. extremely low. Uh, yes. Uh, no, yeah, I, I mean, I guess obviously, I mean, no. I, if I had to name all the pigs, I could probably only name like four or five or six of them. So right. I, I, I actually don't know all nineteen of them. Are you gonna? Are well, you, gonna it, fill you know, in? it's it, yeah. So <laughs> I'm, I'm the, intrigued. It, I know it's like I was like, what you would think because they're pretty widely distributed, yeah, across Europe, Asia, Africa, and now in North America, which they've been reintroduced by humans. So this, the genus Sus is the pigs. So this is where you have your Visayan warty pig, mm-hmm. you know, your Philippine warty pig, your domestic pig, and then your wild boars. Okay. So there's a bunch of them in there. So they, there's a few species there. Then you have this little cute thing called Porcula, which is the pygmy hog. Not <laughs> so familiar. It's really cute. Cute. No. Giant forest hog, the red river hog, bush pig. They're a different genus. Mm-hmm. And those then are you in get Africa. Down, right. Yeah. And then you get to the Barbarossa, which I'm, I'm going to talk about here in a second. We need to cover that. Which, but yes. Yes. Very. Wow. Wow. And and then you get to the warthogs. So the two species of warthogs, the, the, the desert warthog and the common warthog. So the scientific name of the common warthog is Phacoharis africanus. Mm-hmm. And then the desert one is Phacochorus. Oh gosh, it's so hard. These side. This one I'm, I'm loving this week. A Ethiopicus, because I think it's like Ethiopia is, yeah. is where the deserts are. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. So we'll, we'll say we are. <laughs> I'm just so, surprised that Sus isn't in there. Why did I think that Sus would be in their name? Because that's a genus of most of the other. So you have our domestic nine. pig. 
Yeah, domestic pig. Sus scrofa domestica. Okay. And then sus scrofa is the wild boar. Gotcha. Okay. So that's where they... I'm going to get to domestication here in a second, right? So the desert warthog is its own species. The common warthog has four subspecies, which Angie started with. So the no lawn warthog, mm -hmm. which is those ones in West Africa stretching across over to Ethiopia. Definitely haven't seen those. No. The Eritrean which is in Ethiopia, Somalia, no. up in that area. The Central African warthog, which is Kenya and Tanzania. And yes, I think you, you definitely, mm -hmm, the Tanzania. Southern warthog. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, definitely, the Southern warthog. Definitely the Southern one for yeah. sure. Um, yeah. But potentially the cent Central African yeah. warthog. Because you were up in, yeah, you're up in Tanzania, in Tanzania right? Tanzania. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 So, yeah, and the Southern's in Botswana and Namibia. And Zambia's not even Zimbabwe. on here. No, it's probably Southern. That's it's probably Southern. Kind of, yeah. Yeah. Down there. Now pigs, you know, all members of the Sude family are referred to swine. So when you hear that, that's all of them. Now they originated at least 20 million years ago in Eurasia. Mm -hmm. Okay. So like the wild boars, some of them. And you know, like, like again, they're pretty widespread. You have tropical Island. You have some pigs in the high Himalayas. Siberia, you know, North Africa, South Africa, uh, Pacific Islands, you know, now in Australia, now in the Americas. And what's interesting, their common ancestor is the peccary of South America. Okay. Right? Yep. Right. Which so is they're not the, in the 19 species? No. No. Peccaries are their own family. Okay. So that's, they're in the Taya Sude. And that's the Tyusids, the peccaries, or the javelinus. Interesting. So we're going to have to look I love this podcast. <laughs> so, I'm biased, so, clearly. I know. I know. But you, for so long, this is what's so cool. about. I love, I love this natural history. For so long, they grouped the pigs with hippos. Hippo, Hippopotamidae. Okay. The family of hippos. They thought pigs and hippos were very closely related. Well, it's probably because... Hippos are also even-toed ungulates, and they, right. but they have four toes. Right, but... And pigs have two. Our, yes, and our good friend genetics, our favorite topic to study. Such our best friend. <laughs> yes, like love genetics. Me and genetics, we've got that BFF uh, bracelet going on. Oh, and necklace. Yes. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. It changes every two weeks or Chris, something. Chris, I new. wish I would have done genetics. I'll tell you what, though. I'm looking at all these yeah. jobs, these postdocs mm -hmm. for wildlife, and they're like, Genetics genetics, 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 genetics. And I'm like, ah, ah, I can't apply, yeah. I can't apply. There you go. If you're listening and you're really looking <laughs> yeah, to get into conservation, study learn, genetics. If you learn anything from us, go yes. molecular. Or, yes. You know, uh, yes. No, obviously, it's, there's that's other not things, always, but, there's other things, but no, the molecular, it, it really is important. It's important, right. obviously, for these lineages, um, mm -hmm. but it's just uh, even from like the biomedical point of view and things like yeah, that. Yeah, so it is very important, mm -hmm. especially for conservation. But so through genetics, they have discovered that no, they're not that closely related to hippos. They're more closely related to cetaceans, whales. Oh my gosh, I love it. This is why I, I know. love this podcast. I know. Yes, awesome. <laughs> pigs and whales. <laughs> pigs and whales, pigs and whales, pigs yeah. and whales, pigs and whales. Um, right. Yeah, that's super cool. I will have to tell my uh, the class that I'm teaching about this because they right. kind of give me the stink eye when I'm like, oh, yeah, one of the reasons I love dolphins and I love horses mm -hmm. is because they're related. And they just, yeah, they're, how? They're like, they, what? Yeah, it doesn't make yeah, any they don't sense. Get it. So tell us. No, they don't get it. Yeah, so they are. So <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to tell you anything. I'm just going to keep going with <laughs> war dog history. Teach my class for me. I'm kind of like I don't have any. I like say these bold statements that like I've learned yeah. from you, and then I have I don't like have anything to back it up. I'm like, well, back it I up. mean, uh, uh, mm, uh, listen to the podcast or Google it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, it's just you can look at the genetic line, and they they similar genes, so they have closely related genes, and. I mean, I've done, I've dabbled in genetics, done some genetic studies, uh, not looking at lineages, but you know, they, like one of the things I know we look at is maternal DNA, mm -hmm. which doesn't change. It, well, it does very slowly, like one change every hundred thousand years. So we've been able to trace human lineages back to East Africa. 
with these animals, I think they're looking at s similar genetic profiles. Mm -hmm. And so pigs have a closer genetic profile with whales than they do with hippos. That's incredible. So they're saying. That's incredible. So then they, and then people that are smarter than this than us that study this, you know, they'll go back and look at the maps and then they'll, they'll look and put the puzzle pieces together, which we know in this podcast, it changes all the time. Of course. Like, you know, we say, oh, this, you know, they just found this new eel. We covered electric eels two weeks ago. They found this new species Eight just foot. late last year. Yeah, late last year. And genetics confirms it's a different species. Right. Right. So that's the big picture. I did want to bring up the Barbarossa because it is a favorite at zoos. I've seen it yes, quite a few. Definitely, yes. Quite a bit. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And the peccary too, but that's not. not yeah, the peccary is super cute. Mm -hmm. Yeah. These are island dwelling in the tropics. Mm -hmm. They are an ancient relic. They really think because it is distinct anatomically, these, they have the huge tusks and they think it's like, if you want to see what an old pig looked like mm -hmm. way back in the day, okay, this is what you should look at. I also found, this is what's really cool. The oldest known cave painting in the world dates back about 35,000 years ago. In France? In Indonesia. Okay. The, there's those ones in France, but they're not quite as old. And it's of a Barbarossa. Mm -hmm. 35,000 really? years old. Really? So it's really cool. Yeah, it's really that's cool. It's really cool. Oh, wow. So, that's super old and yeah, fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. So warthogs emerged roughly two million years ago, one and a half, two million years ago, the two species. So they've been around quite a while. They've been around quite a while. Now, I just really quickly, humans and pigs, you know. Hold on, really still... quick. Quick time out. Yeah. yeah. I just want to give you a silent sitting ovation. That was one of my favorite evolution <laughs> segments was it? recently. Of pigs? I mean, okay. this month. How about that? We'll throw that out. Okay. Uh, but yeah, okay, okay. no, that was awesome, Chris. Uh, pigs are, they're fascinating. Aren't they I mean, fun? They're See, yeah, they're, they're you're welcome. You're welcome. Buddy. I know. I know. You and your ungulates. <laughs> you and your ungulates. So what I love, and, and I know is one of the things I researched when I wrote my horse book a couple years ago was like the history of domestication. Sure. Because I find it fascinating. Mm -hmm. And they think, you know, because Kazakhstan, Ukraine, that's when somebody first jumped on the back of a horse, they think. With pigs, again, big debate. And it's about 9,000 years ago okay. is when we first domesticated pigs. But they think kind of similar to, you know, horses and donkeys. They were almost simultaneously domesticated. Donkeys in Africa, uh, horses in Asia, where pigs were domesticated, they think, in Europe and then Asia and China around the same time, about 9,000 years ago. So there's a big debate on that. And they think that they were probably introduced by humans in the tropics, not the Barbarossa, but some of sure. these wild boars they mm -hmm. find on some of these islands. And then also in the Americas, it was introduced mm -hmm. when explorers came over. Australia, mm -hmm. it was introduced. And New Zealand. And the interesting thing about New Zealand is it wasn't the Europeans, even though they introduced all sorts of trouble to New Zealand in the 1800s, but by the Maori, when they came over and discovered New Zealand in like the 1500s, they brought ah, some pigs with them. Yeah. Yeah. So humans bring in stuff that they shouldn't. Mm, <laughs> mm -hmm. But luckily, they didn't bring this thing, the largest pig ever or swine-like species ever. <laughs> this thing, you will never guess the name of this thing. Okay. It, its scientific name is Entelodont, but they call it the hell pig or the terminator pig. <laughs> Wow. Okay. <laughs> I'm intrigued. This, this thing died out, they think about 16 million years ago. But this, it's like, I love this. this is, but I find these like, sometimes, you know, when I find these huge mammals or animals that lived once, I just die. I'm like, oh my God, I would love to see Somebody this. Somebody out there this, listening, this. Seth Rogren, if you're listening, mm -hmm. you need to make a movie. Like, you know that like Honey, I Shrunk yeah. the Kids, like from way right. back in the 80s or 90s. Mm -hmm. And then we have Jurassic Park, all about the dinosaurs. Somebody mm -hmm. needs to do one with the giant mammals that yes. used to live. Oh, and not but, just a mammoth. I mean, some of these. No, no, not are the mammoth. Crazy. Mammals. No, like the giant, like yeah. just all of the like the other can, ones. You know, yeah, Chris did the research for you. Just listen to every pod, 
And he's told <laughs> uh, he told you who the giant is and how big it is. So just yeah. take your money with your you know your movie friends, cinema yeah. friends and yeah. like make that happen. And so we can see like what it would have been like if we were walking like, around sixteen million years ago. Oh, it would have been scary because what this does thing... okay? So, anyways, I jumped okay. I, I jumped ahead a little bit. What no, does this hell no. of a Terminator okay. pig look like? <laughs> So it lived in the forests and plains of North America, Europe, and Asia. Of course it did, yep. And it stood almost seven feet tall at the shoulder. Holy, and weigh- that's like, oh. <laughs> yes, and weighed almost like 2,000 pounds. Horse. It's-, it's a draft yeah, horse. So- a, a draft pig. Yes, seven, yeah, 2.1 meters at the shoulder and 900 kilograms or 2,000 pounds. <laughs> this, the Terminator <laughs> pig. <laughs> it's like... Oh. Please, somebody make this movie. Uh-huh. I don't have the skill sets. Oh. I'm not good with like no. computer anime and that kind of stuff. But oh my gosh, how cool! That oh. just be so. Wow. Talk about bringing back things from extinction. No, wow. thank you. Wow. <laughs> wow. So yeah, luckily our little warthogs are not that big. But no, 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 definitely no. not. Yeah. Now warthogs, where you're going to see the lifespan? Most people say around 11 to 12 years. There is some people that claim up to 18. Again, that's debatable, but mm-hmm. yeah, it's about right. I mean, hard life, hard life. Mm-hmm. We talked about the tusks, right? So the tusks are very important to defend themselves mm-hmm. and to fight. So, the, mm-hmm. you know, the, the males will fight, but they have seen many videos of warthogs either being chased by a leopard or lions, and those things are mean. Mm-hmm. They will turn around and slash and gore and whatever they can to to live and they also use the tusks to to really root and turn the soil over things like that well and chris like you mentioned with the tusk too we're all familiar from watching lion king or just in general of the large tusk that curves like 90 degrees mm-hmm. but the bottom tusk the smaller pair that's below that the lower pair they're obviously they're much. The reason you and I didn't really know about them is because they're a lot shorter. Mm-hmm. But they become razor sharp by rubbing against the upper pair every time the mouth is opened and closed. Oh yeah. Okay. So it's like its own okay. natural little file. So yeah. They're you know yeah you don't want to mess with them you don't mm, want to mess with them no 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 no. 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 In general, I one of the, my main scars in my lifetime is from um, jumping over a fence because I uh, upset a mama pig, a domestic. Oh, pig. she didn't even have any. You know, she didn't. They don't. She didn't have any tusks. She's a domestic Tusk. pig, but uh, they do have teeth. Um, mm-hmm. And she was, you know, with her babies, and right. she got mad at me. I forget what I did. I'm sure I did something really stupid because I was young. And I didn't. I just dove over the. the fence. Oh my gosh! Oh god! Oh. And the fence wasn't. No, the fence wasn't high. I just caught. Uh, my shin caught a screw, and um. Oh and no! So, Ow! Yeah, it's like no. It wasn't like even <laughs> stitch worthy or anything. I think it only. Oh, okay. I think the only teeny tiny. It's teeny tiny scars. I'm not. I'm not yeah. a hero. <laughs> I okay, think okay. stretch of the imagination. But I think that the only reason it scarred because it was right there on the shin, and there's not a lot of like you know flesh or whatever. Right. But yeah, I mean, that was without any tusks. So yeah, funny. I just had a flashback. That was like a <laughs> lifetime ago, that story. <laughs> Running um, from a pig. No, no, oh, a mama goodness. pig. Okay. Yeah, I know. I know. I, yeah, I would have jumped out too. I yeah. would have ran out yeah, and jumped but out too. The other thing about the tusks too, I think we we talked about when we covered probably walrus and walrus mm-hmm. and, and also an elephant, but tusks are – they protrude from the mouth but they're made of their teeth they're it's called teeth. ivory which is a problem mm-hmm. for of course a, a potential issue with warthogs um mm-hmm. trying to collect them for their ivory although it's much obviously a smaller piece than an elephant things right. like that but ivory is just a fancy term for tooth bone i mean it's t- right. it's, it's tooth uh but because they do use their tusks a lot for rooting around they do continuously grow Right. And sharpen them. Apparently. And they, they get sharp. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. Uh, and mamas so, and dadas have them. Yes. Males and females yes. have them. So yes. I would Give have been, a, I would have been in, a, in a bigger world of her if I was running from a mama warthog. Well, uh, I know. I know. Yeah. But, they're, they're, yeah. They're defensive. They definitely are. 
Uh, we'll get to their behaviors in a second. Uh, some things, their eyesight's poor, but they have very good sense of smell. You know, it's like pigs root, root around. I mean, mm-hmm. they all do. Good hearing. Oh, yeah. This was surprising. Pretty quick. They can run up to 30 miles an hour. Or I read that. And then I'm like, I really am glad that I have not run into a mama or dad war- warhogs. I didn't know they could yeah. run that. I don't, domestic pigs yeah. can't run that fast. I don't think. No, no. Well, they've been bred for speed and these no. guys have evolved to survive in Africa. No, like, of all I, yeah. Yeah. Like I was able to run and jump and, you know, tuck and roll. And I, it wasn't, right. I must admit, I forgot the landing that I did have was pretty beautiful for my volleyball training days. Like there was a tuck and a mm-hmm. roll in there. Right. Uh, but a little wound afterwards. So. Right, right. Well, you know, and it's the reason they, I mean, again, surviving in Africa. So the young can be taken by eagles and jackals. Oh, yeah. So, of course. Surprising. Then all of them, lions, hyenas, cheetahs, leopards, and crocodile can take any of them. So, you know, they're, they're part of the food web. And, you know, that's why they're, they're tough. I mean, mm-hmm. they're tough. They had, they have to be. They mm-hmm. wouldn't survive if they weren't. Now, these are omnivores, but mainly live off a herbivore diet. Correct. So, yeah. And grasses, you know, they, roots, berries, right. fruits, bark, fungi, insects, eggs, and carrion. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Even poop, dung, they sometimes eat. Sure. You know, it's, you know, think of domestic pigs, like they eat almost anything. Same thing with these guys. What was really phenomenal for me, though, because obviously working with domestic pigs and, of course, a lot of hoofstock just in general, that when they're rooting around or grazing, that they do it on bended forelegs. Yeah, on their wrists. And in order to protect them while they are bending their forelegs to root around, they have these awesome, like, calloused pads, like built-in wrist pads, if you will, not knee pads, Mm -hmm. but wrist pads, Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. to help protect them. But... They're not callous pads that they grow or that that are formed as they're older. These callous pads actually develop on the fetus. Oh, okay. Wow. Okay. So it's so genetic. they're born there with them. Mm-hmm. 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 Okay. Oh well, evolved to have that. Yeah. So the behavior obviously is going to be great. Here's one of the things I learned that I just love. Okay. So in their burrows, obviously they go in there for shelter. They back in. They back up that bus, baby. Yes. They back in to be able to defend themselves with that large snout and those tusks. In the morning, when they wake up, they take off at a run out of the burrow. (laughs) So in case there's a predator nearby, they can outrun it right away. They just snap out of it right away. Like I'm like, what? (laughs) I read that. So I actually should take after a warthog. I... Mm -hmm. I'm always trying to like get a little bit of a workout in. It doesn't, it doesn't just always work. Jump it. No, no. But somebody told me, they're like, girl, you need to just sleep in your workout clothes like the night before. Mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. you can like spring out of bed and I, I don't know, I guess start doing push ups or something. <laughs> and so calisthenics. I, I've never done that. I've, I've, I, I think. Earlier this year, I was like, it's a new decade. I'm going to set my alarm mm-hmm. for five in the morning. And man, I hit snooze every <laughs> it, it, it didn't happen. But yeah, yeah. but now that I know that warthogs do that and they look pretty good and sleek, I, I might need to start doing that. Just just jump right out of bed. Um, <laughs> Instead of sprint? Yeah. yeah just going to be like, what are you doing? You get your sprints in. I do a couple laps around the house. Bring the dog with right. me. And good to go. Um, and then just, and then just jump backwards into bed. Right. (laughs) Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. No, but, but no, you're totally onto something. They love their burrows. They, uh, will often get burrows that have already been dug out from other animals, such as aardvarks or porcupines. And they do use the burrows for sleeping, of course, and where they raise their young. And then of course, as a, as a safety zone from predators. Right. And, they are typically diurnal, um, and so they're gonna they're out during the day, and they're gonna usually at nighttime be in their burrows for sleeping, if you will. And just like their cousins, the domestic pig, they definitely love to roll in the mud. But this is a really important behavior, especially in Africa, because the mud can act as a bit of sunscreen 
from the harsh rays because they're out foraging during the day often. And then also from insect bites too. Uh, I think uh, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. we forget about that a lot. So the mud really kind of just cools them off, keeps them, uh, protects them from UV rays and keeps them uh, from getting bit by bugs as much. Because the other thing too, it's really important for pigs to cool their bodies off because because warthogs la- lack sweat glands. So that's not a way that, you know, how humans, we sweat if we run around the house or whatever to cool ourselves down. They're unable to do that. So the other thing, too, that people probably don't know about pigs in general, um, warthogs, for instance, too, they're really good swimmers. So I don't know if I can say that about a domestic pig, uh, but a lot of the species in the the pig family are good swimmers, which Mm -hmm. you wouldn't think Mm -hmm. of them that way but they are and i also have to give my hats off to disney for doing their homework way back in the day when they made the original lion king and of course the more modern one because they have pumbaa and he's hanging out mostly by himself right or at least not with other Mm -hmm. warthogs right and so that's how it is for the most part is warthogs aren't super territorial and they will overlap each other's home ranges but in general, males are going to be by themselves. And then there's matriarchal lineages of females that stay together. So kudos to them for getting that right. So he wasn't lonely or anything like that. He, he probably met up with Miss Pumba once a year, Mrs. Pumba once a year. And mm-hmm. then they went on their merry ways. So, uh, yeah, there, well, there's not a lot of room in that burrow. I don't think. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Not a lot of room in there. Yeah. Like, uh, like 330 pounds. Yeah. <laughs> male warthog. Exactly. Like who's racing out of there early in the morning. Is it him or is it her? Yeah. Is it him? Is it her? Yeah, it's hard, exactly. hard to say. Yeah. Um, yeah. but do you know what a group of warthogs that are hanging out together? So typically the female and her lineages, uh, do you know what a group of warthogs is called? Ooh, I didn't. Uh, I think it's no, cool. not a crash because that's a, that's a, the best one ever. Rhinos in a crash. I know. Um, yeah, a group of pigs. I don't know. You stump me. <laughs> I'll give you a quick charades hint on the Skype. A lobe, an ear, a canal. A canal? Mm. A, you pointed to your ear and your canal uh, and your ear lobe. Oh, I give your... I'm very not good at charades. Okay. Uh, a, yeah. a sounding. Oh, pff, yeah. I would have never gotten <laughs> I know. That. That's tough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. A sounding? No, that's crazy. Yep. Okay. So a sounding is a group of warhogs that live together, and it usually okay. consists of a female and their young. Males are going to disperse when they're about two years old, and they might – form a bachelor group while they're still working out there, you know, uh, they're learning to play and things like that or stick together, but they're typically going to be solitary. And so the females will stay in these soundings except for when they're pregnant and a sounding can have up to 18 members. Wow. That's big. Mm -hmm. And the, Groups that get along with each other, these female soundings, are going to have a lot of affiliative or friendly interactions with each other, including body rubbing and grooming and just other affiliative behaviors that we're used to seeing in like hooved and horned animals. And some of this body rubbing uh, might also be like friendly scent marking too, because warthogs will have two facial glands, uh, one by the tusk and one by the sebaceous gland that they can use to males are going to mark more than females, uh, but females also have them as well. And so during a friendly encounter, warthogs are going to rub their preorbital glands together. Aww, mm-hmm. that's so nice. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and males, once again, are going to also mark with some of these, the, uh, these scent markings in warthogs are also known to actually uh, as I don't know. I don't think it's, a, I don't think it's super, it probably, it's physiological, but it turns social. So they will defecate mm-hmm. together at communal dung sites. So I guess it's both okay. 
and you know <laughs> social scene yeah, hey yeah, mom yeah. how you doing <laughs> and so but yeah they uh, researchers think that this ritual might serve to protect the warthogs by preventing predators from n- having lone you know knowing mm-hmm. we're all you know having piles of feces right. all over the place Wherever. so if there's right. just one giant communal one um and so I don't, yeah, I don't know if they're in there all together. Like, hey, Georgia, hey, Betsy, oh, what it's is, time to go. It's a behavior. Oh, it's a behavior. But it's I know behavior. there is some in horses. There is some like if one goes, there's some pheromones. The other one will often but go, and the other one will often go. Remember, okay, remember when you and I were doing the Somali wild ass behaviors, mm-hmm. and I recorded it. Yeah, and I recorded it. It was the first time I ever seen this phenomenon where. One defecated, mm-hmm. walked off. Another female came over, sniffed, and she defecated right on top sure. of it. And I was like, what? Yeah. And I was just like, and I looked it up and I forgot the name of the behavior, but you're right. It's like to hide numbers. Yes. It's something they've learned. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I don't think like, they're all reading their magazines together, but I think they all, no. it's probably somewhat synchronized of, especially with pheromones of like, let's get this all out right now. We're right here. And then we can move on and forage. Well, and it's not like leaving little breadcrumbs exactly. like exactly. Nobody whatever, wants know? little tasty turd tidbit, <laughs> yeah. tidbit. Bre- yeah, for the lions, like no, no, no. Yeah, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta keep them yeah. guessing. So, uh, yeah, it's crazy. I know animals are so cool. Uh, yeah. mm-hmm. Another, uh, well, and also too, I didn't see this behavior when I was in Africa, but if an, a warthog is alarmed, say from a predator, and whether they're in a sounding in a group or solitary what they'll do is they'll run and we know they run fast with their tails held straight up and the tassel and waving as a visual sign so Mm -hmm. especially if they are with other warthogs that tail up and that that the flicking of the um of the tassel on the end of it is like let's go let's go let's go and so i thought that's really interesting because that kind of reminds me of horse behavior a little bit when they're really hot and freaked out and they're if they're running they a lot you know a lot of them arch their tails too. they don't yep. wag yep. it per se the same way that mm-hmm. um these warthogs do but yeah i just thought that that was an interest inter- interesting uh common denominator but as far as vocal communications uh pigs they grunt they squeal they snort and they communicate a lot of different things they communicate greetings they communicate defense they communicate friendliness, um, submission. So, and, in a courtship too. So mm-hmm. they're, you know, they're, they're a vocal animal for them, which everybody knows pigs oink. I think that's a little bit cliche, but they definitely do make different vocalizations depending on what the situation is. Um, they might even squeak sometimes too, like little baby warthogs. Oh, I love it. <laughs> um, I know, I know. If, uh, and, and of course, uh, a male, if he has to fight another male, um, to win a female, he'll, he'll even grind, he'll grunt while he grinds his teeth. But Chris, the deep dive that I went down this week, uh, one of a couple of them is pig intelligence. Uh, it's so- very smart. Yes. I mean, that's, very that's smart. the cliff notes. If you guys want to fast forward mm. now to the next few minutes. <laughs> um, mm. but. Yeah, but I'm really trying to look at, uh, because of course, a lot of my research I've done with horses is looking at horse cognition and how do we prove this and how do we show it? Because as we talked about, even with oc- on the octopus pod before, intelligence, the way that us humans think about it is our own narrow niche, right? Is okay, you know, mm-hmm. can you do math? Can you have a language? Do you have a, a community? Things like that. And I'm not saying that those are bad ways to um, judge intelligence but it, there are human ways to do it and so but somebody got it right um a famous writer by the name of george orwell um mm-hmm. he's an american writer wrote the work of teaching and organizing the others fell naturally upon the pigs who were generally recognized as being the cleverest of all animals they're smart they are very smart Yep. They are very smart. And then the uh, their eyes, I mean, I know their eyesight not, isn't brilliant, but just they almost have like a human eye, um, at least domestic pigs. Um, uh, as far as when you just look into their eyes, they're just really, really intriguing. But 
looking into their cognition, I, I, it was somewhat similar, um, or I was surprised to find there's probably actually more done with horse cognition, which is still not very much. But I was able to find an article from 2010 in Current Biology, which is a really, really good journal. It's uh, like a sister to Cell. Um, so mm -hmm. uh, where Mendel and company explored uh, pig cognition in general. And it was, it was kind of just a, a quick review. Um, but the biggest thing to note is not a lot has been done. And so the authors mm -hmm. talk about that is there's just still so much we don't know about how smart they are. But we do know that pigs can definitely discriminate between individuals um, of pigs and individual humans, and they'll do this for a food reward. Their memories that have been tested, they, they haven't done any really long-term testings. And of course, these are on domestic pigs, not warhogs. Mm -hmm. uh, they haven't really done any long-term testing, but they know that they do have a good short-term memory of at least, you know, a couple weeks, six weeks, things up and so forth from the memory studies that they've done. But the authors claim that there's nothing really that's been done long-term. And they had did the mirror self-recognization test, which, of course, elephants pass and marine, some marine mammals and uh, parrots, some parrots and things like that. Uh, and the pig, like, kind of passed it where – it definitely, they're not sure if it recognized, they don't, they won't say that it recognized itself, but it was like looking behind the mirror and acknowledging mm -hmm. obviously the reflection and knew like that the reflection wasn't like another pig, if you will. Right. It, right. So it was kind of like trying to figure it out. But once again, there's just not enough data to really have it fall into the yes or no of the self recognition of the mirror. But once again, that's our human projection on what we think self-recognization is, right? Um, but what I found was this cool story. Put your seatbelt on. Okay. So okay, okay. piggies can be amazingly deceptive. So what they did is they trained pigs to go into an arena and the pig would forage, right? Pigs are super food motivated. They love food. Who doesn't? And it would find the location of the food. And so on the first day of the, the trial, the pig would forage and find the food in a certain location. On the second day of the trial, this informed pig, so the informed one that knew where the food was, is reinduced to the arena with a friend, okay, the novel pig, who mm -hmm. doesn't know where the food is, right? He hasn't been in the arena mm -hmm. at all. Well, what ends up happening is the new pig had understands very quickly that the other pig is informed where the food is. So it'll follow it and try to like beat him to the food. Right. Right. Okay. Right. Right. So the informed pig figures that out and is like, Oh no, 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 no. We're not going to do this. So the informed pig starts kind of bluffing and, or won't go into the arena unless the, new pig is like not looking and won't follow him in. <laughs> and if he does follow him in, he'll like not necessarily go to the food or, you know, right. he'll like basically try to trick the pig that was tricking him. Oh gosh. That's so funny. So uh, I mean, some really like cognitive, thoughtful under, so a lot of, so one of the things that researchers that study cognition and me me measure cognition is this thing called episodic memory. And that's remembering what happens where and when. Mm -hmm. And we mm -hmm. love to think that us humans are some of the only animals that can do that. And so this is proof in the pudding that it's not necessarily the case. And, and also studies with mini pigs, so those are pigs that people have as pet, with miniature pigs. Mini pigs can definitely remember what object was encountered where. Mm -hmm. And... Researchers think that that's at least a glimpse of this episodic memory, which is once right. again considered to be like, you know, he, what makes us humans so darn special. I knew the behavior was going to be good. Yes. And what's and now? Yeah. Oh, so by the way, I didn't couldn't find anything about warthogs specifically as far as their intelligence, but it's their cousin. I'm sure it's somewhat similar. It some of it carries yes. over. Yeah, yeah. carries over.
And so, like you said, they're related to like dolph- whales and dolphins. Yeah, I know. I mean, granted, that they're was like smart, millions so. and millions of years ago, but still. Yeah, they split. Yeah, their brain still grew. So how do they breed? What's the repro look like? Because you always see the pictures of the females with all the piglets and running around. So cute. Well, they are super cute. And so they're seasonal breeders. Um, and so they usually give birth only one time a year. And the rutting or the seasonality is going to begin late in the rainy or early in the dry season. Interestingly enough, warthogs have the longest gestation of all pigs. So okay. mm-hmm, it lasts That's 170 right. to 175 days. So how many months is that? Mm-hmm. Like uh, uh, five? Yeah, five six. to six. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. And so, yeah. I mean, I, I didn't know. <laughs> it wasn't a quiz. I was just, <laughs> yeah, just like. I did do quick uh, math. <laughs> but no, but it makes sense because. So they begin courting at the the end of the rainy season, the start of the dry season, to make sure that those cute little piglets are born in the rainy, like when the grass is green back into the rainy season, during the rainy season. And so a fun little fact, too, about warthogs is they have a polygony andry system. Okay. And that just means that both males and females may have multiple partners during a breeding season. So go, girl. And so, Chris, another behavior that's uh, been reported that I found super fascinating is although the sow typically she'll she'll isolate herself during the birthing process, but if there's other sows that have been part of her sounding or part of her family and they're closely related, they can nurse her young. And this behavior, it's called allosuckling. And so it makes them cooperative breeders. And the aloe suckling is, in some species, it's known as like milk theft or like, you know, trying to get your baby to grow faster, quicker. But in warthogs, researchers think it's a sign of kin or related. Okay, it's got to be related female altruism. So like two sisters or cousin, female cousins helping each other out. So pretty cool stuff. Um, uh, and then the warhawk piglets will be weaned at about 21 weeks of age. And the males will stay with their mothers until they're about two years of age. And then they'll be chased off because they become sexually mature. But that's if they survive. So unfortunately, you kind of mentioned the, earlier in the podcast. It, right, yeah, it's right. about 50% a survival okay. rate to the first year of life. So, you know, it's tough. I yeah. mean, it's a harsh, harsh environment. I mean, harsh, yeah. a lot of predators. Yeah. And it kind of made me laugh too, though, that, um, the mama warthog pig, you know, if she does give, if she does have a litter every year that she will sometimes have to chase off her younger teenage Once kids like yeah. get out of the burrow it, get right, out right. i haven't you know i have another group you know i, I have these newborns coming mm. in and so the circle of life right i know i know so even though she may have to kick her teenagers out or she'll kick the male out definitely by the time he's two um the males aren't really going to be sexually mature until they're about four. And that's why they might spend some time in like a bachelor warthog okay. group, um, group yeah. in general. So, and, and it's similar age for the females, but yeah, if they're annoying her when she's got her next litter due, she's like, you out of here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 Make room, mm-hmm. make room. Well, you talk about that, Angie, the, like we, we opened up the least concern with the common warthog and the desert mm-hmm. warthog. Uh, but their population is decreasing, and there's only about 22,000 of the common warthog. Right. That's not many. Oh. I mean, it's not a lot. They cover a lot, a lot of territory in Africa. So. Oh, huge territory. Yeah. So it's not a ton. And so it's, you got to keep our, our, our eyes to it. Desert warthog, they didn't have a population on it, but I can't believe believe it's much more than maybe a couple thousand. I mean, they're they're in such a small corner of Africa. Are they they're listed as? Least concerned, too. Huh. Okay. But but it's probably not a lot of data and a lot of this. And I think we're running into this with IUCN so many species and they just don't have the resources to cover them. And, and it's like, you look at a population of 22,000 and they're decreasing, but they're not, 
you know, on the endangered list because there's so many other animals that are in, right. in dire need, right. you know? Right. So it's, it's not like, Oh, they're just doing great. I mean, they're, they're fine. They don't see any major problems right now, but you know, with this just decreasing habitat, we got to really keep our eyes to it. So who's out there fighting for warthogs or Africa yeah. animals in Africa? Well, one yeah. of, uh, one of my favorites, um, African wildlife foundation, they can be found at awf.org, and we'll, we'll put them on our show notes. But they, as Chris mentioned, recognize that 22,000 is not enough warthogs, then, especially for this area that they cover. And so, and according to their website, they're considering them least threatened. So I don't know if that's different mm-hmm. than least concerned. But anyways, uh African Wildlife Foundation has come up with solutions to protect warthogs. And so number one, first and foremost, is to create more protected spaces. So they work with governments and local communities to designate wildlife corridors and large areas of land that the warthogs can run, roam from one park or one country to another. So these corridors are huge. And, and uh, I learned a lot, a little bit more about this when I was in uh, Kruger about how some of the corridors to some of the other wildlife parks that are attached mm-hmm, to them. Mm-hmm, and so mm-hmm. those are huge. And so, mm-hmm. and secondly, the African Wildlife Foundation is working with educating local communities and conservation. So these rural communities that have to live in close proximity to wildlife can sometimes have conflict with them. And so Mm -hmm. by helping educate local communities about how to perform conservation and how, what to do if there is an animal in your neighborhood and you're having an issue with it. Um, So they teach school children and then of course also work with the local adults and the elders in the community as well. Mm -hmm. And so they basically, their ultimate goal in general and, is to just basically foster a culture of con- conservation locally right. there Good. on the ground. So African Wildlife mm-hmm. Foundation, of course, they have several species they protect. The warthog is one of them. So thank you for all you do. Good. Good. Well, that kind of rolls into what Pumba means. Oh. It's kind of funny. Okay. So Pumba doesn't mean warthog okay. in Swahili. Yeah. It it's actually means to be absent-minded, careless, foolish, ignorant, lazy, stupid, and negligent. What? So Tanzanians and Kenyans call warthogs, they describe them as Pumba, because, not because of the Lion King, but because when they do come through these villages or interact, they just create havoc. I mean, they just tear up the gardens, the village. They just make a mess of everything. So they call them Pumba. To yell at them because they're just destroying the village. So, so there you go, Seth Rogen. That's what it means. I'm sure he knew that, but you know, well, I think I love think, an animal. I mean, I, that's I love the history behind that, but I think we learned the opposite yeah. today that they are. Oh, they're very. Smart. I mean, they can yeah, run. They're, they're, first of all, they're not lazy. Uh, you know, they are sprinting out of their burrow. They're getting their, their morning yeah. mile in before I've even yeah. have my cup of coffee and they're super yeah, smart. Yeah. They're super smart. Yeah. So. They're very smart. They're amazing. The amazing creature. So, you know, meerkats and warthogs back to back week. Hope you enjoyed the interview with Mike Veal again, global conservation force. Check them out, please. They are just amazing. And we've got some great stuff coming. I mean, some great stuff coming. Yeah. Thank you for listening and having fun. There was a lot of laughs. I'm glad we got our, our first uh, species of pigs under the book. And Pick, yeah. hopefully... Uh, 18 to go. I was going to say 18, <laughs> 18, 18 left. To, man, job security, buddy. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah, no, there you go. All right, take care. Listen. Learn. Share. Join the movement at allcreaturespod.com.